Central Texas is blessed with some of the most beautiful, crystal clear rivers and springs in the world. But we also count almost 5 million people and more on the way. That means we have over a hundred of these wastewater treatment plants. But what do they really do with our human waste? We all poop and pee. But have you ever wondered when you flush the toilet, where does it all go? You may be thinking, the ocean, underground, or perhaps like many of us, you just flush and forget. Today, we are here to change that. Let's be curious and learn what's important about managing our human wastes. Would you ever consider putting toilet water here? Well, officials at the city of Dripping Springs, Texas, want to dump their city's treated sewage right here up to 822,500 gallons per day. Onion Creek is a classic Texas Hill Country stream. It's crystal clear with high levels of dissolved oxygen and very little algae. Perfect for swimming, wading, fishing, and observing wildlife. It starts in the high country of Western Hayes and Blanco counties and tumbles down the Balcones escarpment before joining the Colorado River near Austin's airport in southeast Travis County. Along the way, the water is used in many different ways for recreation, a source of drinking water, and habitat for fish, invertebrates, and endangered aquatic salamanders that have adapted to its clear, high oxygen, and low nutrient waters. Also, as it tumbles down the Balcones escarpment, it passes over a complex limestone geology of faults, fractures, sinkholes, and caves. In places, springs emerge and flow in the creek bed. In other places, Onion Creek disappears into those fractures and sinkholes, leaving the creek bone dry while providing groundwater recharge for the Trinity and Edwards aquifers. In fact, so much of Onion Creek flow disappears into the aquifer that Onion Creek is the largest source of recharge water for Barton Springs. Unfortunately, the city of Dripping Springs wants to add one more use for Onion Creek, repository of the city's sewage. For most of us, after we flush, our body wastes wind their ways through a series of pipes and down into a wastewater treatment plant. These plants consist of a series of filters, mixing and settling basins, and use biological, chemical, and physical processes to remove some of the waste, convert some of it to less harmful forms, and then either discharge what's left to a nearby creek or river, or reuse the wastewater for irrigation and other non-potable uses. For 20 years, the city of Dripping Springs has been disposing of its treated wastewater via land irrigation on fields owned by the city. This low-tech method utilizes nature to protect waterways. The vegetation and soils receiving the wastewater assimilate the nutrients and other pollutants in the wastewater. But Dripping Springs sought and won a permit to discharge its wastewater into Onion Creek in 2018. This controversial proposal was opposed by downstream landowners, environmentalists, and the city of Austin. That permit is being challenged and, for now, Dripping Springs is still irrigating its wastewater. During low flow conditions, like in late summer, the creek could be 10 parts treated sewage and only one part natural base flow. While treated wastewater contains a number of pollutants, the nutrients phosphorus and nitrogen are often the pollutants of greatest concern. Hill Country streams naturally have very low levels of nutrients. You may be thinking, but aren't nutrients a good thing? Sure, if we're talking about eating your vegetables. Too much phosphorus and nitrogen ruins aquatic ecosystems. Phosphorus and nitrogen are the primary components of fertilizer. They make our crops grow. Human waste contains high concentrations of phosphorus and nitrogen. While advanced wastewater treatment technology can remove a lot, the remaining levels of these nutrients can be 50 to hundreds of times above the levels naturally found in pristine hill country streams. Likewise, too much nitrogen and phosphorus in hill country waterways can leave them green with algae. How much is too much? 
We're talking levels hundreds of times above the natural baseline levels. No fun to swim in, but even worse for aquatic life. Nutrient pollution is pandemic, plaguing lakes, rivers, and oceans across the planet. Municipal wastewater and agricultural runoff are the primary sources of nitrogen and phosphorus pollution worldwide. One of the most infamous examples of nutrient pollution in the world is found in the Gulf of Mexico. Fertilizer-laden runoff from farmland across many states is carried by the Mississippi River into the Gulf dead zone, covering 7,000 square miles, where reduced oxygen levels kill fish and other marine life. Here in the hill country, our nutrient pollution comes from municipal wastewater, as opposed to farmland runoff. Certain kinds of algae can even be toxic to humans and pets. These problems are not new. Public officials recognized the threat of water pollution decades ago. In 1972, Congress voted overwhelmingly and President Nixon signed into law the Federal Clean Water Act. This act set a national goal to end discharges into the nation's waters by 1985 and protect the status of clean waters as fishable and swimmable. Those goals remain a cornerstone of the Clean Water Act to this day. That was almost 50 years ago. Yet the discharge of municipal sewage to our nation's waters persists. There is right now evidence of sewage discharges in the hill country causing algae blooms. Liberty Hill, Texas, a small town in far western Williamson County, was in the news recently for its fouling of the South San Gabriel River. The photos and drone footage show exactly what happens when treated sewage is discharged into crystal clear hill country waters. This is the San Gabriel River downstream of the wastewater treatment plant. Likewise, this aerial photograph of the Blanco River was taken in April 2019. You can see that the river is covered in algae. When the city of Blanco was discharging, comparing to this image taken earlier this year after the city had stopped discharging and was irrigating instead for a number of months. Dr. Ryan King, a biology professor at Baylor University and director of its Center for Reservoir and Aquatic Systems Research, studied the effects of wastewater on aquatic life at four hill country waterways last year. Dr. King conducted extensive water quality testing at several sites along these waterways and found that the streams not receiving any wastewater had very low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, low levels of Cladophora algae, that's the green filamentous icky kind, and a high variety of macroinvertebrate life, i.e. bugs, supporting a healthy fish community. Professor King's research on these four hill country streams was consistent with almost 20 years of published research funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and our state counterpart, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. In the video we're about to show, Dr. King discusses the results of his biological and nutrient assessments of the Blanco River in 2019. Hello, my name is Dr. Ryan King. I'm here to present a summary of results from nutrient and biological assessments of the Blanco River in 2019. Before I get into the results, I would like to tell you a little bit more about me. I was trained at Duke University with a degree in ecology, a PhD. I worked for the Smithsonian Institution as an ecologist for almost three years before moving to Baylor. I was named full professor in biology in 2014, when I was also recognized with an outstanding professor award. I've served as an expert witness in eight federal cases involving environmental pollution, with a couple of additional cases here at the state level. I've published approximately 100 journal articles and reports, with many of them focused primarily on figuring out what levels of nutrients, specifically phosphorus and nitrogen, trigger harmful changes in algal growth and aquatic life so that we can work to keep our waters below these threshold levels. The Blanco River research I will be summarizing here reinforces and supports my studies over the past two decades. This previous research has focused on the effects of nutrient enrichment in streams. 
the Environmental Protection Agency and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, or TCEQ, each commission studies to help develop biological indicators with the ostensible purpose of establishing um, numerical nutrient limits. These two studies, lasting from 2006 to 2009, collectively demonstrated that in Central Texas streams with less than 15 micrograms per liter of total phosphorus, or TP, we consistently found very low levels of nuisance filamentous green algae, particularly Cladophora. Cladophora is a genus of filamentous green algae that is very widespread and tends to be the dominant type of nuisance algae in streams throughout most of North America. We also found in the low phosphorus streams that dissolved oxygen levels remained high enough to support aquatic life use designations, even at night. Often, oxygen will deplete significantly at night under high nutrient conditions, and we found that was not the case in streams with less than 15 micrograms per liter total phosphorus. These low phosphorus streams also had exceptional diatom and macroinvertebrate communities which are two of the key biological indicator groups used by the state of Texas to assess stream health. We had three years of fish data from 38 different streams throughout the Cross Timbers region and found exceptionally high quality fish communities here. Three st these streams were mostly in the Cross Timbers but were limestone alkaline streams very similar to hill country streams. Conversely, when streams exceeded 20 micrograms per liter, things began to dramatically shift. And once we exceeded 20 micrograms per liter, we consistently found high levels of nuisance filamentous green algae and low oxygen. At night, we would see that oxygen levels would crash below three milligrams per liter, a level too low to support many native aquatic species. Similarly, in streams above 20 micrograms per liter, the diatom and macroinvertebrate communities diverged dramatically from the low nutrient streams and looked typical of highly nutrient rich ones. So whether it was 20 or 50 or 100 micrograms per liter, most of these streams would look very similar. This is what we call a threshold response where you get above a certain level and you, and you just start to have blooms and very rapid changes. The fish communities in these systems were typically dominated by invasive species that are not highly regarded, such as common carp, which is not native to the United States, and red shiners, which are native but have become invasive as they proliferate under high nutrient conditions. To further increase the validity of these observations, we conducted controlled experiments at our research facility at Baylor University. There, we have 12 streams designed to mimic natural conditions, supplied by high quality water from a nearby constructed wetland. We conducted nutrient dosing experiments where we observed changes in biological communities associated with different levels of phosphorus. We randomly assigned the streams different phosphorus dosing levels from low, the background level from the wetland, which was very low, 20 and then 100 micrograms per liter. And while we found many different changes across variables, the most obvious finding was that just after four weeks or 28 days of dosing these nutrients, nuisance green algae, that is Cladophora, proliferated to the point where there was just as much algae in the stream receiving 20 micrograms per liter as there were in the streams receiving 100 micrograms per liter. By contrast, in the control streams, which received no nutrients, there was almost no Cladophora. So this takes us to the Blanca River. Last year, local news outlets reported on striking filamentous algal blooms that blanketed the river. Dr. Jeff Back and I were asked to sample in a couple of different locations by Save Our Springs Alliance. We sampled upstream of the city of Blanco, adjacent to the Smith family property on Goldman Smith Road, and downstream of the city at, the, at what's called Blanco Settlement. Both of these sites were um, in reaches of the river that were free flowing and did not have any impoundments, that is, dams. We sampled both of these sites in mid spring during what would be high flow or non storm flows, but just normal base flow when there's more water in the stream, which is typical early in the year. We sampled again in late summer when flows began to recede, and in normal Texas summers, 
a lot of hill country and, and central te Texas streams will even stop flowing due to lack of surface runoff and hot conditions. We wanted to contrast these two seasons as well as the upper and lower reaches. From here on out, um, when I say the lower reach, I'm referring to Blanco Settlement, and when I say upper reach, I'm referring to the Goldman Smith Road location. So this is an image of what the Blanco River looked like at Goldman Smith Road in April of 2019. And you can see that the water is crystal clear. The stream bottom is largely clean, and it actually has a golden color from thin layers of diatoms, which are naturally what you'd expect to find and some white chalky cyanobacteria that again are also what you'd expect to find in a really low nutrient stream in the hill country. There's very little evidence of nuisance filamentous algae at this location. <laughs> this is a beautiful site, just gorgeous. Now this photograph was taken on the same day in a downstream location. This is the Blanco River at Blanco Settlement just below Highway 165. You can see that the stream bottom is covered in algae to the point where there are mats starting to form along the stream margin. It smelled. It was not a pleasant place to be. This is not a normal level of algae that would ever grow in a hill country stream without human inputs of nutrients. There can naturally be small blooms of algae, but you would never see this much. So seeing this, it was pretty obviously related to some sort of external nutrient input. The figure I'm showing here demonstrates five different parameters analyzed in the water samples. First, I want you to focus on total phosphorus, or TP. The blue line and dots represent the Blanco sediment lower location, and the orange is the upper, or Goldwyn Smith location. And you can see that Goldwyn Smith was always below 10 micrograms per liter. However, we found total phosphorus at the lower site to be above 20 micrograms per liter two out of the three times we sampled. In the upper right graph, this is what's called orthophosphate, or PO4P, a dissolved form of phosphorus. And this is what's considered bioavailable. When you have values above 10 micrograms per liter of dissolved phosphorus, that's indicative of excessive nutrients. In general, with the exception of ammonia, or NH4N, in September, Nutrients were always higher at the lower site than they were at the upper site. Now keep in mind that what you measure in the water during these sampling events is just a snapshot because the nutrient levels are in fact affected by what's going on in the stream itself. That is, are there algae in the stream and are they taking up nutrients? An existing bloom can be pulling a lot of nutrients out of the water, so you may not see a high level of nutrients consistently. But when you think about how much phosphorus and nitrogen has been stored on the stream bottom in the form of algae and other microbes, that also has an important perspective. So moving on, we often think of water clarity as a really good indicator of water quality. Recreationally and aesthetically, hill country streams are crystal clear and beautiful. We found particles in the water at Blanco Sediment that were usually several fold higher than above, than above at the Goldman Smith Road site. So the first plot is called AFDM, which stands for ash free dry mass. That basically means this is non clay and silt and other particles that could be related to something stirring up the bottom like cattle or carp that create sediment. This is in fact organic matter most likely related to algae. In fact, if you look at the pattern with CHLA, right next to it, that stands for chlorophyll A, that's how much chlorophyll is in the water column. And we see the same general pattern with chlorophyll as we do with ash for dry math, which means there's a lot more chlorophyll in the water at the downstream site than the upstream site. And then finally, total suspended solids in milligrams per liter ex ex exhibits a similar pattern Total suspended solids, or TSS, includes non-organic matter, which could include other things, um, like again, like clay and silt. But the point being is that the data suggests that most of the cloudiness in the water at Blanco Settlement was related to algae in the water column. This is our general conclusion here, and so water clarity is obviously an important issue, and we see really big differences between the upper and the lower site. Well, what about algae growing on the stream bottom itself? 
Recall again that ash-free dry mass a AFDM relates to basically how much organic matter is on the stream bottom. And this is in grams per meter squared. Now chlorophyll A, CHLA, is how much algal biomass in milligrams per meter squared is on the stream bottom. And you can see the two have very similar patterns. Dramatically higher levels of both at the lower reach than the upper reach. And note that above 150 micrograms per liter uh, per meter square is often considered to be a nuisance level of algal biomass. And we see that we have over 150 even in the low flow hot dry summer period, which is when you'd expect a lot of this algae to actually start to die, senesce and float downstream. Yet there still was that much algae at the lower reach compared to virtually none at the upper reach. Another thing we did is we sent samples to a world-class taxonomist, Dr. Barbara Winsborough, who estimated biovolume by counting and identifying and even measuring cells of algae. With that data, we can estimate the biovolume per unit area of certain species of algae. So instead of just saying it's chlorophyll, which is all types of algae, we could say, this is how much cladophora there is. So remember, Cladophora is the really, well, kind of nasty nuisance filamentous green algal species. And the pattern we found was that very high levels of chlorophyll at the lower site relative to the upper was being controlled almost entirely by the amount of Cladophora growing on the stream bottom. And you can see that from the picture I showed earlier, there were huge mats of, of filamentous green algae, most of which was in fact Cladophora. So what about higher trophic levels, such as macroinvertebrates, that is, bugs and crustaceans. These are organisms that the state uses largely to assess biological condition of its fresh waters. And what we found was there were extraordinary densities of certain species or genera of macroinvertebrates at the lower site, particularly during the algal bloom, when compared to the upper site. In fact, uh, when you when we would get down below that layer of algae that was growing on the stream bottom, the, the, the bottom sediments actually stunk. They were black and even anoxic, meaning there was very little oxygen and the sediments were, um, were, were being reduced and smelled like sulfur. So not surprisingly, we found primarily macroinvertebrates, at least the high densities, that are indicative of wastewater, huge numbers of them. So looking at the upper left panel, there's a mayfly genus called Betis. Usually mayflies are good indicators of water quality, but Betis mayflies are found almost everywhere. In fact, it's not unusual to find huge numbers of them below wastewater treatment plants. As a genus, there are certain species that are very tolerant. This is not surprising that we found a lot of, of Betis. Similarly, the Gizia is a flatworm and almost always found below wastewater treatment plants in large abundances. We also found oligochaeta or segmented worms. Worms eat and decompose organic matter. Having aquatic worms in huge densities and actually huge biomass, because these are really large organisms here, tells us that there was an unnatural source of organic matter in the stream. And then finally, Ficella, which is a lunged snail. It gets oxygen from the atmosphere and therefore can tolerate low dissolved oxygen levels in the stream. And there were thousands upon thousands. Look at the densities here, over 35,000 per meter squared of snails. That is highly abnormal. They're grazing on algae and decomposing organic matter. So overall, the densities of macroinvertebrates were, were much higher at Blanco Settlement, the lower site. But the ones that were there were the ones you'd expect to find, uh, expect to find below wastewater treatment alpha. So what about fish? We did electrofishing and seining consistent with TCEQ protocols. And we found indeed, not unlike macroinvertebrates, there were tremendous numbers of fish at Blanco Settlement. However, they were dominated by just a few species. One was a fish called a stone roller, which grazes on algae. They have a mouth that turns downward so they can graze algae from the stream bottom. We also observed thousands of juvenile sunfish primarily bluegills and long ears. Both are native species, but to see that many is highly unusual. We also collected prolific numbers of schooling baitfish called blacktail shiners. 
they are native, but again, unusual to have prolific numbers. However, upstream at Goldwyn Smith, we found much lower densities of fish, but the fish we found were larger and more consistent with what you'd expect in a hill country stream, such as really large red-eared sunfish, some far bigger than my hand, and several largemouth bass weighing three pounds or more in addition to some smaller schooling fish and so forth, but again, rather different than what we saw downstream. So in summary, the fundamental question is, do we see different levels of nutrients from wastewater discharge and what, and what effect does that have on the river? At Blanco sediment, phosphorus was elevated, nuisance algae were much more abundant, and macroinvertebrates associated with wastewater proliferated. Fish communities were dominated by small bait fish and juvenile sunfish. At the upstream site, we found almost no algae, larger game fish, and a balanced ecosystem of native species. To put this in a broader context, these results are entirely consistent with multiple published re research papers concluding that phosphorus levels below 15 to 20 micrograms per liter are necessary to protect native aquatic communities and prevent excessive algal growth. Such as, the, such as this enormous aggregation of filamentous green algae that we documented at Blanco Settlement. So thank you for your interest in this Blanco River Nutrient and Biological Survey study. You may read the report by me and Dr. Back um, on this study and three companion studies on three other Texas Hill Country streams that are also threatened with municipal wastewater discharges. And that's posted on the Save Our Springs Alliance website. And I hope you find them useful as you think about how we manage our municipal wastewater while we pursue our nation's Clean Water Act goals to maintain and enhance the physical, chemical, and biological integrity of our nation's waters, including the Blanca River and all of our Texas rivers and streams. Thank you.